Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Janet, for inviting me months and months and months ago. Um, so here we are. Um, and uh, thank you for my special friend, Linda, and Mary, and Al being here. I've known these guys as long as I've been in Sarasota. Um, actually, I met Linda before I arrived in Sarasota. We were on the plane sitting next to each other in 1993. And I was flying down to find a place uh, for us to live. At that time, my wife had just had our second baby. And, and the four of us were moving to Sarasota. I'm sitting on the plane with Linda, and I'm sharing my story, and I asked if you knew any babysitters. And she was like, well, my daughter Amanda is 11 or 12 at that. And so even before landing in Sarasota, I had a friend and a babysitter. <laughs> and I just had lunch with your son the other day, so it's all about the community, and I was, I'm thankful that you're here, and I appreciate the uh, invitation. So. There's so much to cover about cannabis that um, one hour may not be enough. So if you have questions after, uh, after we adjourn, you can email me. I gave out my cards or my brochures and my cards are over there at the table. I answer all emails, info at Neurology of Cannabis, or you can call and we can have a discussion if you have additional questions that we don't get to today. It's a big topic. Um, and I'm going to break it down into five sections. The first being, what is it that we're even talking about here? And the answer is, we're talking about a plant. A plant that has been around for as long as humanity and probably before humanity. We have genetic analysis of frozen samples uh, from the uh, Arctic that show that cannabis seeds have been present e even predating you know, our earliest recorded history. And then, of course, cannabis was a very important agricultural product in Asia 5,000 years ago. It was used for the essential oils that came out of the hemp seed and also to make paper products. And then cannabis as a plant, or weed, if you will, migrated along with people down through uh, Southeast Asia and over to India and Afghanistan and grew wild. Uh, it, was, it was a very common agricultural uh, product, not just uh, something that was uh, grown on purpose, but it would grow out in the wild, and we call those land races. And uh, eventually, uh, it became known to Western civilization when a Dr. O'Shaughnessy, uh, who was from England, was studying in India, and he discovered that the cannabis plant was very effective for a variety of medical reasons, uh, including rabies, where it helped a lot with the muscle spasms that patients had. And it was useful for other things. Pa people had been using cannabis for all those thousands of years for different reasons, epilepsy and so forth. And we have records of that in, in these ancient texts. Well, O'Shaughnessy brought it to England, and in the, in the uh, 1880s uh, provided it to Queen Elizabeth, who we believe used it for her migraines, and it was very popular. Um, there were many journals that were written about the benefits of, of cannabis sativa, which means cannabis that's grown on purpose. It's, uh, it was an agricultural product. But the cannabis that he brought back from India became known as cannabis indica. And that's where we have the two popular names, the indica and sativa, some of you may have heard of. The other popular variety of cannabis is ruderalis, cannabis ruderalis, which would grow on the ground and, and stay very low to the ground, and that was, pop, that was growing in as a land race in Afghanistan and those regions. So anyway, O'Shaughnessy brings cannabis indica to England. It's very popular as a migraine remedy. It was also very effective for gastrointestinal problems. It was one of the most effective treatments for cholera. Uh, during the epidemic at, at the end of the 19th century. And it continued to be very popular even in the New World. We have documents and, and artifacts uh, from Eli Lilly and other pharmaceutical companies that were uh, selling their meds in the, in the early uh, 20th century. You know, cannabis indica in tincture jars, 19, dated 1910, good for migraine and gastrointestinal problems, nervousness and so forth, until 
1937, when the Cannabis Tax Act went into effect, and cannabis was no longer available as a medicine because of basically socio-political reasons. Now, imagine this. Cannabis as a plant has been available and effective for a variety of medical problems for 5,000 years. It's only in the last 80 years that we have not had the advantage of using that plant in the United States because of prohibition. So that's now ending. We have 33 states in our union that allow medical cannabis, 11 of which are also adult use, we call it, or some people refer to it as recreational, where patients don't need, people don't need a doctor's order to get it. And so the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, the horse has left the barn. The, the cake has risen. <laughs> the, 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 the cannabis story is being told and words like billions of dollars of industry, fastest growing industry in the world, things like that are happening all around us and there's no stopping it. And that's okay as long as we have our eyes open and understand what we're doing, right? You know, there's other plants that are not so great for you all the time and cannabis is not so great for you all the time. You know, what about the, the opium poppy? Right? Poppies grow, it's plant medicine, does that make it okay? Well, it's great for pain relief, but people get addicted to heroin, which is a byproduct of the opium poppy plant that grows. What about uh, the bark of the willow tree, which is the source of, anyone? Aspirin. Aspirin. That was not a planted answer. <laughs> um, digitalis, digoxin, comes from the foxglove plant, so plant medicine has been around for a long, long time, and these products, these molecules that grow in plants that have medical uh, benefits antedate pharmaceutical companies coming up with their single molecule therapies in a laboratory and selling it at an exorbitant prices, but that's my bias. Um, so, you know, in America and in the West in general, we're used to pharmaceutical companies promoting, selling, um, bribing, uh, doing what they can to make a profit on illness. You know, in Western medicine, we treat diseases. Um, in the East and historically, people were treated in a way that would maintain wellness. So the Western model of medicine is to treat illness, but in many ways, what we all need to do is promote wellness. And cannabis, I will be telling you, is another way to promote wellness. So it's a plant. We break it down into molecules and we can talk about it. THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is part of the plant. It is the psychoactive part of the plant that can make you high. There's another part of the plant very popular, CBD, cannabidiol. These are molecules that, that live in the plant. There's lots of other molecules, hundreds and hundreds of molecules. We call them cannabinoids. Tetrahydrocannabinol is one type, cannabidiol is another type. There's a bunch of others, lots of syllables. You can go to our website and read all about them. Um, there's terpenes, the molecules in the plant that make it stinky. You know, you know that when, pots, when people smoke pot, it stinks. Well, that's not the THC or CBD. That's, this, that's what's called the terpenes. So there's molecules in the plant that are aromatic. They provide the aroma but also separate medicinal effects. For example, certain types of cannabis plants will give you an energizing, happy feeling, and others will give you a sedative, sleepy feeling. That's the terpenes. That's not the THC and CBD, just as an aside. So that's what this is. It's a plant, it's a weed, and it grows. There's male and female cannabis plants. Uh, the, the female plant flowers, right, it, it, it attracts uh, bugs for pollination and then when it's pollinated it creates seeds and that's the way it works. Any botanists out there? No? No? Yes? Any home growers? No? You don't want to admit that? That's fine. Um, the, 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 the plant has, is, is, uh, has male and female parts. If you get the female bud without the seeds, that's called syncemelia. Some of you may have heard that. Um, and so there's this whole uh, industry now that has uh, developed out of the need uh, to grow more and more potent marijuana, 
out west where cannabis is um, legal for adult use. So, of course, you know, in California and Oregon, for example, since the 1990s, cultivators have been trying to make stronger and stronger cannabis. And what does the market want? They want to get high. So those cannabis products have been cultivated to increase the level of THC, reduce the amount of CBD, and so you have a very potent product that's available for most people interested in cannabis. Now, when patients come to our clinic, they don't want to get high necessarily. They want to relax from anxiety. They want to treat their epilepsy or their joint pain. They have all, all sorts of other issues. Um, and what we need to do is we need to provide products that will enable patients to get better with cannabis medicine, but won't interfere with day-to-day -day life, won't cause intoxication or impairment, won't make them high, just make them feel better. So that's what we do in the clinic. We use different products that are available at the dispensaries here in Florida to balance the effect, to create wellness, improve symptoms without causing impairment. So what is cannabis not? It does not have to be intoxicating. You don't have to smoke it. It's available as a liquid tincture or a capsule, cream, or patch. We have all these ingenious methods uh, to consume and use this medicine um, without being intoxicated or impaired because people have jobs. Just because you have joint pain and you want to take something to relieve that doesn't mean you have to be impaired, although people are using oxycodone and hydrocodone recommended by their doctors and pharmaceutical companies like it's going out of style. Everyone knows there's a crisis in terms of opioid overuse. But cannabis is a, is a very potent analgesic and anti-inflammatory agent, among other things. But patients need to use that medicine during the day and still remain functional. So we do that. We are able to get that done. But cannabis is not always an intoxicant. It doesn't always have to be smoked. And it usually does not cause addiction. Now, Addiction is an interesting term because I think it carries a very um, worrisome connotation. But you know what? For a while there, I was addicted to caffeine. I would get up in the morning, the first thing I would do would be make my coffee. If I was somewhere else and there was no coffee, I would be like, oh, where, where am I going to get my coffee? I was addicted to coffee, you know? For a while last year, I think I was addicted to this Netflix show. <laughs> You know, I would watch it and then it would end and I would have to immediately watch the next episode. Of course, they planned it that way, but I fell into it. So is that, that's a bad thing, right? So what is addiction? Addiction is a behavior that takes over other behaviors. So if you're addicted to something and then you modify your behavior in a way that eliminates other things, you're potentially addicted. If you have a drive to find that cannabis and you eliminate social activities because you're busy looking for cannabis, or if you give up an opportunity to do something else because you're busy getting stoned, then yes, that's a type of addiction. But that's no worse than being addicted to coffee or Netflix or sex for that matter. Those are all addictions. Now there's physical addiction and there's psychological addiction. What I was just describing are psychological addictions. Although caffeine, you can get a withdrawal headache if you give it. So that's a bit of a physical addiction, too. So there's different levels of addiction. And I will tell you that cannabis does not cause addiction much. But in young people who use a lot and become preoccupied with acquiring and using cannabis, that is a form of addiction. They need someone who used to using cannabis at high dose will develop difficulties with appetite and sleep for about four or five days, and that's it. That's the whole withdrawal process. So addiction is not always what it's cracked up to be. It, it means different things in different situations. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, how does it work? This is my favorite part. Um, how does cannabis work in the body? The reason it's my favorite part is because there is basic science evidence that describes how this drug works in the body. This is not snake oil, okay? This is not cold lasers. This is not bee stings or, 
or so there's so many other remedies that are available out there that are advertised in the paper that don't have a scientific basis, but cannabis does. How do we know that? Because in 1964, Professor Raphael Meshulam discovered THC at the Hebrew University and then was able to, with his colleagues over the next years, find out that in our own bodies, we create molecules that are similar to that. We have receptors in our brains and bodies that bind THC and CBD to some degree, but in our own bodies, we don't have THC and CBD. Let me put it this way. God did not put receptors in our bodies to bind plant material. She put receptors there so that, <laughs> so that, so that our own endogenous cannabinoids, our own molecules in our body would bind those receptors. Have you guys heard of um, a runner's high? Mm -hmm. A runner's high is, is the common term for that, that feeling of happiness that people get after they exercise vigorously. And that has to do with something called endorphins. Endorphins is the term to describe the endogenous, which means inside the endogenous opiates, like morphine. Endorphins, morphine. Morphine is exogenous. It comes from the poppy plant. Endorphins are molecules in our bodies that we produce. Okay? The she god didn't put endorphin receptors in our bodies to bind the poppy plant, no. Those receptors are there in our brains to bind endorphins, our own molecules. In our bodies, we make our own cannabis molecules. They're called that are in our bodies to bind receptors that also bind plant cannabinoids. So what if you have a deficiency of serotonin? Can't sleep. Can't sleep. Depression? You get depressed or anxious. So if you have a serotonin deficiency, now we're talking about molecules in our body, serotonin and dopamine. If you, have a, if you have a deficiency of serotonin, you can take a medicine like Paxil or Prozac, and that enhances the serotonin levels and improves depression. So what if you have a, what if you have a deficiency of endocannabinoids? What if you have a deficiency of arachidonic, arachidonyl glycerol or anandamide? What happens? Well, we believe now that conditions like fibromyalgia, chronic migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, and a host of other problems that we really don't understand, they may be due to a deficiency of the endocannabinoid system. Some people just don't have the right chemical balance for whatever reason. And how are we going to treat those individuals? We're going to give them cannabis, medical marijuana which basically binds to the receptors that we know are there, we've seen them, and supplement that person's endocannabinoid deficiency. It gives me chills just thinking about it. I'm not kidding. That is so cool, is it not? So what's wrong with using plant medicine in a proper and measured way to, to, to treat a metabolic deficiency in people's bodies? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless, of course, it causes harm. Um, if, if, if someone uses too much cannabis and they get in a car and they get into an accident, bad. If they're addicted or they develop a, a, a condition called cannabis use disorder, not so good. But is that any worse than someone that takes too much ibuprofen and gives himself an ulcer? Or someone that's taking you know, a, a, a Valium or a Xanax every night because they can't sleep or they're addicted to Ambien. All of those conditions that I just mentioned can be treated with cannabis. And, we're looking, and you guys will see this in the years to come. Cannabis science is just going to take off. It's been, it's been functioning. The cannabis research and science ha industry has been quite active in other countries. Um, only you know, in the United States during prohibition because cannabis is a Schedule I agent and, and can't use it for research, um, it's been limited in the United States. But in other countries, we have a lot of research. So if your doctor says, well, I don't think cannabis is good because there hasn't been enough research, well, that's because they never taught us about cannabis medicine in medical school. 
But the research that most doctors see in the United States is not in you know, these international journals. And certainly, the pharmaceutical companies don't want the medical doctors to learn about how cannabis can replace Ambien. So that doctor that says that is just misinformed. And uh, maybe we need to teach them. And that's why I give talks like this to physicians as well. I'm actually giving a talk to the Memorial Hospital Oncology Group um, November 6th. So put in your calendars. It won't be this talk. It'll be a different talk. So we have to educate each other, and that's why I'm here. Uh, and when patients come into the clinic and, and then I see that they've told their friends and their neighbors that it's safe and useful, it's just, it's just fantastic. So education is super important. So why use cannabis? Well, I've mentioned a few things. It's great for pain, and it's great for anxiety. It's great for treating illnesses, but as I mentioned earlier, it's also great for promoting wellness. So in patients with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, there's a process that goes on in the brain called excitotoxicity, where there's too much excitatory chemicals like glutamate. There's also a, a, a concept called um, oxidative damage. You've heard of um, antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E. Well, oxidative damage in the brain is what triggers some of these problems like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's dementia. And if you use antioxidants, it can help reduce some of that damage to the neurons. Uh, same thing with the glutamate. The point I'm making is that we may be using, in the future, we may be using small amounts of cannabis to function as an antioxidant and reduce the chance of developing things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We have some data in the laboratory that shows that the plaques that build up in the brain, the amyloid plaques that are pathognomonic of Alzheimer's disease, those plaques are reduced in laboratory animals treated with cannabis. Of course, they can't remember where to get the cannabis because, but no, 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 seriously, seriously, these mice are smart and, and, and they're smarter. And there was actually an article in the Scientific American, I think it came out this past week, um, that, that highlights that particular research. Same thing with Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are degenerative conditions. They're part of the aging process in a lot of people. And one of my professors used to say, if, if you live long enough, you'll develop Parkinson's disease because you run out of dopamine. But what's really happening is this oxidative damage, for example, is part of normal aging. It, some people refer to it as rust. But you can slow that down with something like cannabis. So stay tuned. Cannabis is great for treating symptoms like anxiety and pain, insomnia, epilepsy, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Crohn's disease. We have data showing that cannabis is effective for these and other conditions, like glaucoma. There's, the list goes on. But the thing that really excites me is that how cannabis can be used someday to promote wellness and reduce disorders of aging and, uh, and, and maybe something that people take just when they're feeling well to stay well. So how do you get it? How am I doing on time? Good, right? Okay. How do you get it? How do you get cannabis therapy? And, and, and how do you use it? Well, as you were saying, there's a cannabis clinics in town that will see you, take your money, and then put you in what's called the registry for the state that allows you to then get cannabis at the dispensary. Now, that particular clinic is my competition. They charge $125, but they charge you another $125 later in the year. They don't tell you that. They don't have really a cannabis expert there that's going to teach you about what types of cannabis to take, when to take it, and so forth. And there's a lot of docs out there that are writing these qualifications and then stamping your application so you can go to the dispensary and get your medicine. 
but it's hard for many patients who are especially new to cannabis therapy to know what to buy. So out west, for example, the bud tenders they're called, the folks that work at the dispensary, most of them are extremely knowledgeable. If you go to a dispensary in California, Oregon, or Colorado, for example, and you say, okay, I have anxiety, I need something, they'll, they'll be like, okay, try this. And that's nice. So they have knowledge, they can give advice, I appreciate that. Here in Florida, it's really beholden on the docs to provide the advice because the number of educated bud tenders at the dispensaries is, is, not, is smaller than it is out west. I'll leave it at that. There are some really knowledgeable people at the dispensaries and I've been meeting them and talking to them, giving lectures there, and we're gonna get really good at this one of these days. But now it's still, it's still really new. So when it comes to choosing what type of cannabis you need, THC, CBD, one of the other cannabinoids, or those aromatic molecules I was telling you about, that's the kind of thing that sets our clinic apart from the other clinics. We provide that kind of advice, and that, uh, that is a shameless plug, and so there it is, I put it out there. <laughs> so what happens? You pick up the phone, you call our office, you say, okay, I saw Dr. Stein, I'm interested in trying cannabis therapy, what do I do? You come into the clinic for an appointment and we discuss what's called a qualifying condition. In Florida, as in many medical states, you have to have a condition that qualifies you for the use of medical cannabis. And that includes some of the ones I mentioned earlier. Plus, if you have a condition that's similar to one of the others, you also qualify. So for example, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is a qualifying condition, and that's a severe anxiety disorder where individuals that have had traumatic events have memories that can't be suppressed, and, and those memories are intrusive. They, they bubble up to the surface even when they're in the car or at the market, um, and, and it affects their functioning. So patients with PTSD have a severe form of anxiety. Cannabis qualifications include a condition like PTSD or like Parkinson's disease. So if someone comes to the clinic and they have anxiety, I can PTSD type of anxiety. Someone has a tremor, they can qualify because Parkinson's disease qualifies, even though they may not have Parkinson's. Patients with arthritis pain would qualify because there's other conditions on the list, like chronic pain, uh, that would qualify them. So you come to the clinic, you pay me the money. Very important. I'm just saying. And then, and then I qualify you by putting your orders in the computer. It starts the application process. And then you get an email in about two weeks from the state. Congratulations, you're approved. Then you go to the dispensary and buy your meds. It's really that simple. F, excuse me? In Northport? You can, there's, there's dispensaries in Northport, I believe, yes. But not around here. There are around here, too. Okay. They're what popping up. What happens if you cross lines? What State lines? lines. Good, good question. I'll address that in a minute. Okay. So you can get cannabis at many different dispensaries. More are opening up all the time. Um, and they have different products. And that's something else that we provide in our clinic is guidance on which products are available where which products to use to achieve what you want to achieve. So for example, let's say you need fast results. You can inhale the medicine as smoke or vapor. You don't have to go and buy a vape cartridge somewhere else that may be contaminated and cause this vape-related pulmonary illness everybody's been reading about. Those are bootleg vapes that are being produced and sold on the black market and causing severe pulmonary illness and death in some individuals. These vape cartridges at our dispensaries are regulated, they're clean, they're uncontaminated, and there's certificate of analysis documents that are available to show that there's no heavy metals, pesticides, mold, and other contaminants. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, the regulations that surround the products at the dispensaries are super important. Um, we don't want our patients, nobody wants to take medicine that's gonna make them sick. So there's that. There's topicals. Um, my nurse has a, a bad arthritis in her knees, and she actually uses a little gel that she puts on her arm that gets absorbed into her bloodstream. 
It doesn't cause any psychoactive effects, but works as an anti-inflammatory. There's edibles in the form of capsules that you can take that are not like the gummies because there's no food, but they're capsules, you swallow them down, and they create a long-lasting effect, let's say, to help you stay asleep. Whereas when you inhale the medicine, it's a short-acting three-hour effect. The gummies or capsules last six or seven hours. So we talk about the different administration methods. We talk about um, what to expect. And in our clinic, after you leave, we give you contact information so you can reach out to us and we can adjust your therapy. So those are the main topics I wanted to address. There are certain legal issues that are important. You're not allowed to take your cannabis across state lines because it's not legal federally. If you cross from one legal state to another legal state, you're still in trouble because the act of crossing the border is a federal offense. Cannabis, as far as our federal government is concerned, is a Schedule I drug, which means it has no medicinal value and, and high probability for abuse. This is ridiculous. Um, it was Nixon's administration that created this uh, scheduling um, as a way to uh, reduce access to this drug and promote um, pharmaceutical dollars. Everybody believes that cannabis is helpful, really. Even though it may not be for you or you, it's still helpful. Tell them I, I won't talk with anybody till I get my lawyer. Okay. So that whole Schedule One issue is going to go away someday, and then we can do research, and then we can transport cannabis across state lines. But for now, you're not allowed to take your cannabis across state lines, and definitely not out of the country. Uh, there was a young American who was busted in Russia for having bud, having flour. So, no, you can't do that. Um, but a lot of people do. Um, so we can talk about that off the record sometime. So I, I, I just want to thank, thank you for having me. This was kind of like a whirlwind tour of, of historical botany, biochemistry, and practical neurology. Uh, there's a lot more we can talk about. So I think I'll end there and, and start taking some questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is it banned for athletes? Banned for athletes? Well, yes and no. So for professional athletes right now, um, there's, there's a controversy. Um, the NHL is doing better than the NFL, for example. So there are ways that some professional athletes are being represented by their, by their um, uh, uh, support groups and so forth. And then there are others that are still having to deal with uh, not being able to use it. So in general, um, it is banned because some people consider it uh, a performance enhancing agent and it's illegal let's face it in some states so if you're a, if you're a, if you're a linebacker and you travel even if you have your card in Florida and you travel to another state with your cannabis you're in trouble um, so y the answer is yes those individuals oftentimes don't have access but I can tell you that the vast majority of professional athletes are using cannabis for pain relief and to recover from their ex from their sessions um, because it's much better than taking the opiates that the trainers have been providing them. And everybody knows that. So uh, that's a problem. Yes, sir. Can you take CBD across state lines? Yes, but it's not always clear because it depends on where the CBD was derived from. So if the CBD is THC-free, has no THC in it, um, you're probably good to go. The TSA has put out a memo recently saying that they will not be stopping travelers with CBD. Even though a couple of months ago there was someone's grandma busted for having CBD at Disney World. Right? And if you cross from Canada to the US, the, the laws are different. 
Um, in, some, in some ways, even if you're in the cannabis industry and you're not even carrying cannabis, you can't cross. There's, there's a lot of bad things going on with that. But in general, based on a recent TSA memo, travelers will not be detained for having CBD. If travelers are caught crossing state lines or trying to go through security at the airport with marijuana, with THC, and I, I didn't get to talk about the difference between cannabis and marijuana and hemp, but we can get into that if you want. Those individuals will be referred to local law enforcement. So TSA's job is not to arrest anybody. It's just to detect problems like you know, firearms and bombs. They're not that interested in cannabis anymore. I know that because I, I have a, f a friend of the family who w used to work at the airport, and he told me that. So you're okay with CBD? Yes. Uh, are any of your services covered by Medicare? So, so the question was, <laughs> are any of your services covered by Medicare? And the answer is no. Why? Why is it not covered by well, because it's illegal federally, and, and Medicare is a federal business, okay? So any companies that are basically either employees of or do business with the federal government, they cannot deal with cannabis industry. That's why cannabis is a cash industry, because the banks that are FDIC insured, federal deposit insurance, they can't deposit the money. So can't be used for cannabis transactions because those are national companies. Mm. When I opened up my business two years ago, I went to Wells Fargo, I got my employer uh, identification number, my EIN number so I could pay taxes, and I, and I got my LLC, Neurology of Cannabis, and I, and I went into Wells Fargo and I sat down, and I was like, okay, let's do this, you know? I want to be legit. And they said, okay. And they opened an account, yup. And I put some money in there. And about six weeks later, I got six, six weeks later, I got a letter from I think it was Iowa, Wells Fargo. We have closed your account <laughs> because they saw the word cannabis, yeah. even if our local branch was like okay with it, because it's so new, people don't know. So, so I have to I have to have what's called a DBA, doing business as account. And so I'm trying to be the good citizen but I have to do it in a covert way. It's weird. Yeah, so what are you doing business as account? <laughs> so, cash. So, so it has to be cash. When patients come in, they have to pay cash. We can't use credit cards. Check, check, checks. checks, personal checks are no good. And credit cards are no good. Debit cards are no good. Because all those are federally based vehicles. They're all federally based. So we take the cash. Just, this is going on all over the country. You know, what about a company in Colorado, for example, that, that wants to, you know, put in a new lighting system in their office? It's cash. People are walking around with duffel bags of 20s trying to do business, right? How can a young entrepreneur build out their business and open a clinic and get a business loan like any other normal commerce would take place? They can't. So. A few weeks ago, the, the House of Representatives voted in the affirmative on a new banking bill. I think it's called SAFE, S-A-F-E. It has to do with um, the Tenth Amendment, which is the banking, I think, that says that, that the federal government will not interfere with state-run businesses and the, those businesses can do banking if they're within the regulations of that state. So that just passed the House of Representatives, the SAFE Banking Act, I think it's called. So if that passes in the Senate, then banks and credit card companies can participate in cannabis commerce. It's kind of a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a good thing. That's what we want. Because those tax dollars that are going to be earned from the cannabis industry will go to improving our communities. And we've already seen some of that in Colorado. Yes. So CBD is a miracle drug, if you ask me. CBD binds in the body in ways that help improve digestion, reduce anxiety and pain, reduce epilepsy. It's approved 
for epilepsy, CBD, not over the counter, but there's a prescription uh, that's available called Epidiolex. Um, but CBD over the counter is a little bit more difficult because everyone wants to get in on the cannabis train and make some money. So there's a lot of bad actors out there. A CBD that's produced from hemp, which is a cannabis plant that has less than 0.3% THC. That's what hemp is. Hemp is cannabis, okay? It just doesn't have as much THC, the intoxicating molecule. It has very, very low THC. And it's grown for its, um, its industrial properties, making oh. rope. Is that what you said? Yeah, it's rope. It's rope right. and, 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 and paper. And, and the seeds are good for oil and so forth. That's what hemp is. You know, when George, I, I digress. When, when, when our, our founding fathers created the 13 colonies, initially everyone was required to grow hemp. It was such an important agricultural product. Anyway, CBD from hemp, which has little to no THC, is very effective for a variety of conditions and it's very safe. Unfortunately, everybody in the, in the cash grab now is producing CBD from sources that are not reliable. And it's contaminated oftentimes with pesticides and heavy metal. Sometimes it's contaminated with THC. So buying cannabis, or rather buying CBD products over the counter is difficult because it's hard to know really what you're getting. There was an article in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, a couple of years ago that studied 60 or 70 CBD products that they, that they bought online. And they analyzed each to see if the contents matched the label. And in 70%, they did not. And it's FDA approved? It's not FDA approved. So how can it be on the market? Because it's over the counter. It's a, nutri it's a nutritional agent of some sort. Vitamins. Some, I, don't, I don't know the details about the FDA thing with the nutraceuticals, but it's, it's not regulated by the FDA. CBD is not regulated by the FDA. Another thing about CBD is it's great for collecting toxins out of the ground and uh, was planted around Chernobyl to pull all the radioactivity out of the soil. And that's, it, it's, it's great that way. Hemp is a great accumulator. It's accumulator. It accumulates toxins from the soil. Can we throw it in our oceans and get rid of this? <laughs> so hemp is a super interesting plant, and CBD from hemp is a great biological product, but you have to be really careful about where you're getting it. The CBD you buy at the dispensaries is clean, and it's free of toxins and pesticides and so forth. So for a lot of our patients, we use high CBD, low THC products because you don't need a lot of THC. That's what I was saying earlier. You don't need to be stoned or high to get the anti-anxiety and pain relieving effects of cannabis. You don't. But you need a little THC because in our bodies, that's the way the biology works. It's called the entourage effect. If you have one molecule at high dose, it doesn't work as well. And we know that because in 1987, Marinol, which is synthetic THC, was approved by the FDA. To, to be used in AIDS patients and chemotherapy patients to reduce cachexia, nausea, and vomiting. But Marinol, which is synthetic THC, actually makes you depressed. <laughs> and people don't like it. Nobody uses it as a drug of abuse, even though it's THC. Same thing with CBD isolates, which is uh, basically pure CBD. It just doesn't work as well. But if you have CBD with a little THC, which is really what we're talking about here is plant medicine, not something doctors in the West are comfortable with at all. That's what works better. The police uh, tend to charge people with DUI if they've been on marijuana, uh, even though they can't test for it with a breathalyzer. Yeah. Does it indeed cause impairment uh, when you're driving a car? Yes. Driving under the influence of marijuana uh, can impair your ability and put others at risk, put yourself and others at risk. So if you are impaired and, the, and you get into an accident or get a ticket and the officer smells cannabis or sees cannabis in your car, you can be liable. But, but, but if you use cannabis 
as a medicine and you're not impaired and you're driving and you get stopped and somehow they know that you have cannabis, you will not be liable for that because you're not impaired. Is there any testing that's available or being developed to test at the scene by the company? There is, and that's especially um, important right now in Canada. On October 17th, Canada went adult use legal for cannabis countrywide. And the police there have been trying different technologies to identify recent cannabis use, measuring not only concentrations of cannabis, but also the, phys the, the physical impairment. And they are coming up with some tools to use uh, to measure that. There's a swab that they have that can measure cannabis content in the oral saliva that supports that it was used recently, um, as opposed to, for example, urine or blood tests, which are not effective measures of cannabis intoxication because cannabis stays in your system for two or three weeks after your last use. So many people will go to a cannabis-friendly uh, state like Colorado and go skiing and eat a gummy and sit in the hot tub great. Next week they come home, they get into a car accident and they get tested for cannabis in the urine and they will show positive THC in the urine, but they took their last cannabis dose a week ago. Does that mean that they should be liable for that? No. No one's getting arrested for using cannabis two weeks earlier because of that. But more acute use or, and causing impairment, that is, that is still a no-no. And so there's a whole industry, there's actually a whole cottage industry that's, that now is growing around how do law enforcement measure for impairment um, and intoxication with cannabis. So that is an issue. Thank you. Is there an age limit? There is an age limit. There is an age limit. Okay. So in Florida, in Florida, if you want to get a cannabis card and, and use medicine like that, you have to be 18 years or older. But if you're less than 18 years, you can still get cannabis medicine if your parent or guardian gives consent. Why is this important? Because cannabis is great for autism. It's great for childhood epilepsy. It's great for anxiety and migraines, which by the way affect young children. Would you rather have your child taking Xanax because they were in an altercation and now they have insomnia? Or would you rather having them use a plant that is, through a doctor's guidance, not going to cause addiction or dependence? So we treat, we have kids with autism, ADD, um, epilepsy. We're using primarily CBD products because we don't want to interfere with their brain development. Um, uh, that was my next question. I knew that. Yes. <laughs> so cannabis can interfere with brain development if the, if the amount of THC, if there's a lot of THC being used, and it's used in a high dose chronic way. So we're talking about, you know, several joints a day for years. There have been studies that show that you shave a few IQ points off if you are a chronic heavy user. So yes, there's that. And so because our brains continue to develop well into our 20s, um, we don't recommend patients use high-dose THC products in that age group. And so thank you for asking that. But that doesn't mean we can't use high CBD, low THC in a cautious way for kids that need it. Yeah, uh, recently uh, there was an office party and uh, some homemade brownies were served, and unbeknownst to the party goers, it was laced with marijuana. And um, what, how, is, how are we going to police this? Uh, what is going to stop people who come to your clinic, for instance, and get it, or any clinic, from turning around and selling it to young people, young kids who, as you just pointed out, in development, brain development could be hampered in that way. There's a whole area that, that is controversial, that's difficult. So the, the question was, what, what are the downsides to putting cannabis out there into the community? 
Because, you know, there are some people whose intentions are not so pure. You know, when it comes to diversion, we call it, people that want to use cannabis and then sell it, that's diversion. Um, number one, I can usually, personally, I can usually detect if someone's coming into the clinic and is just trying to scam the system. Because I sit down and I interview them. I, I look at medical records. And, and we, we try to weed out those people. <laughs> Weed out. Weed out. <laughs> no, it's a serious topic. It's a serious topic. So um, diversion is not really a big problem because the black market is cheaper for those people. California, the black market is still the regulated medical market by 100%. So there's a huge black market even in states where medical cannabis is available and recreational cannabis because the, the costs are less and they don't have to deal with the establishment. So diversion turns out not to be a big problem. And a, as far as people using cannabis to play tricks on their, on their corporate guests, I, I mean, you have to have faith that people are not gonna do that. I mean, that's kind of a, that wasn't a party you attended, was it? That was a hypothetical. It was in the newspaper. Well, that's, that's, that's just bad. That's mean. That's just mean. But I mean, think about it. You know, back in the day, people used to put LSD in, in you know, do you remember, do you remember um, Timothy, Timothy Leary, right? You know, remember what was going on at Haight-Ashbury? I mean, I read about it. I don't know. But people that were, people that were dropping out and, and dosing up and turning on, they were sharing acid. They were dro They were putting acid in each other's drinks, and and it was and that all went away, of course. But I, I don't think that's a big risk in a in a community. I mean, actually, I'm more worried about my girls getting you know intoxicated on roofies when they're at the bar. So you know, we teach our kids that when they're at the bar, they need to take their cups with them to the bathroom. And, and, and I think people just need to be smart in general about that. What happens if you mix alcohol with this cannabis? How is it more effective, ineffective? What you're trying to... <laughs> yeah. What, is, what are the ramifications of mixing? Mixing. So the question was, what about mixing cannabis with alcohol? And I think that speaks to a larger issue of medication interactions in general. Because let's face it. Some people use alcohol as a medicine, right? They use it as a relaxant. And, and that's fine for them, but there's a lot of people that are addicted to alcohol or depend on alcohol as a relaxant. Maybe they're not alcoholics, but they use it. So sometimes what we do is we switch people from alcohol dependence uh, to cannabis dependence. I mean, let's face it. Cannabis is much safer than alcohol. It doesn't affect the liver. People that are using cannabis don't beat their wives. They don't, they, don't get into, they don't get into as many car accidents because they're driving very, very slowly. <laughs> right? So, um, so, so in, that, in that process of getting off alcohol and maybe switching to a different relaxant, sometimes patients will use that together and it's not unsafe, but we don't recommend people use cannabis with their alcohol when they're new users. If you're a new cannabis user, we recommend that you not use alcohol at the same time. But the effects, th there's no synergy. Like there is, for example, with opiates. If you're taking hydrocodone or, or oxycodone and you use a little bit of cannabis, there is a synergistic effect. And, and a small amount of cannabis enhances the effect of the opiates. So patients that are using, for example, tramadol or oxycodone for chronic back pain, they add a little bit of cannabis tincture usually when they take their opiates and then the opiates are actually more effective and last longer without additional respiratory depression. Remember, people are dying every hour from opiate overdose because of respiratory depression. Cannabis does not do that. There has never been a person who has died from a cannabis overdose, ever. Because in the brain, the back part that controls the respirations, there's no cannabinoid receptors back there. She was pretty smart, eh? 
the, the cannabinoid receptors are in the motor system and in other areas of the brain. Yes, question. Time, we're up. Time is up. Wait, hang on a second. I just got to say two other things, but hang on. And cannabis does affect those enzymes, the P450 enzymes, and can throw off the INR or the level of blood thinner in your system. The same thing with medicines like fluconazole, which is for fungal infections. Um, and there's certain anticonvulsants. So, yes, there can be medication interactions and it can require adjustment in your other prescription medications. So, yes, there is that. And when patients come in, we take a history, we go over their medicines and look for those interactions and try to avoid any uh, uh, toxic effects of using the two together. Thank you for asking that. Um, that was actually the other thing I wanted to say as part of the drug interaction thing. Okay. I guess that's it then. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.